Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Thank you so much for joining us today um, uh, so I'm thinking, I'm like, do you even need an introduction? You know, obviously becoming, you are the president of Australian National Imams Council It's a very big position on top of all the sheikhs and imams in the country Hence why I think three of us have developed a really good set of questions for you That the viewers would enjoy And I usually um, ask, the, ask, ask a very nice icebreaker question and my icebreaker question for you, which I think could develop into a really good conversation, is are we in the end times right now, considering how bad the world is? You've hit me with the hardest and toughest <laughs> question out of all. Uh, you know, uh, now obviously, in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1,400 years ago, he said that I was sent and the day of judgment like this. And that's the gap that's left between the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the gap. So are we at the end of times? Yes. But when we say end of times, is it years, is it centuries, is it millenniums? Allahu alam. So we know that the time is going to end. However, we need to prepare for the time when it ends. And uh, one of the preparation, inshallah, is for us to continue preserving the Islamic identity and making sure that we are proud Muslims and we continue safeguarding the interests of Islam in a country that we live in, in Australia. Yeah. Sheikh, um, there's... A bit about your background that I'm familiar with that many people may not be familiar with. And that is because many of the shuyukh that you studied with were teachers of mine in Melbourne and whatnot. I want to take our viewers there. So this mm. is going a long way back. So for those who aren't aware, Sheikh Shadi is uh, of Palestinian origin. Parents migrated here in the 60s and you were born and brought up over here. But your study of deen, where you became a sheikh, was where? Okay. So yes, my parents migrated here over 50 years ago. I was born and raised here. I went to local schools here and then I went overseas, I went to Pakistan. So if that's what, what you're trying what, to what, allude yes. to, that was Pakistan. What, why Pakistan of all places? You know, I've so got Pakistani yeah. background, I, I have a heritage, yeah. I am very, very intrigued well, frankly by frankly speaking, I'm trying to figure out the answer for the last 30 <laughs> years. <laughs> I think Allah just wanted me to go there and I appreciate going there because, you know, it toughens you up. You see the world in a different angle. And um, Alhamdulillah, that's one of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon me that I went through that tough and rough patch on my life. How many years? I was there for two years, two straight years. I didn't come back. So that was the beginning of my journey in seeking knowledge. Obviously, I went to Pakistan and memorized the Quran. And I was in a village of a village in Pakistan. Wow. Yeah. And usually when I tell my Pakistani friends that I went to Shahadatpur, a lot of them tell me like, I can't even believe it even went to Shahadatpur and that I born on bread in Pakistan. But Alhamdulillah, I do believe this part of the upbringing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted me to go through, the development that Allah Azza wa wanted me to go through. Because, you know, Someone who's born or raised here, who has children who are born or raised here. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we are very fortunate to live in a very wealthy, comfortable country like Australia. And a lot of the times, this comfort makes us take it for granted, not let us see the other side. And I've realized that the vast majority of those who are born or raised in Australia think the entire world is Australia. Mm -hmm. But true. when you go to places like Pakistan, you start appreciating what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And it connects you to the other side, you know, because we're one ummah. So, yes, it was a tough, challenging time when I went there. It was a very tough environment, but I appreciate it. It made me who I am right now. And you were, there were a group of you who went there together, I'm assuming? Yes. In the 90s, there was a, you know, a good number of people from Australia who went overseas, who went to Pakistan in particular. From my understanding now, a lot of people are going different destinations. Yeah. But alhamdulillah, like I remember in uh, Dar al-Ulum that was in, which is known as Dar al-Ulum Husayniya, uh, maybe during the peak time, we had about 15 Aussies, 15 Australians, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, most of them didn't finish because of the hard and challenging nature of living there. And uh, but Alhamdulillah, it was a good experience. Mm. Yeah. But but I, I think what some people fail to realize is that the sacrifices and struggles that you as a group made, you brought back those dini, that, those teachings and that knowledge, you brought back over here. And now so many kids over here, someone like myself, I've done hefid in Melbourne. I didn't have to go to Pakistan. I never traveled or whatever it is, even though I have Pakistani heritage. So it's a testament to the sacrifices that you as a group made mm. uh, in your own individual ways, your own individual journeys, that so much of us, so many of us today, like there are schools and many madaris and whatnot in Melbourne, Sydney, across Australia that produce, you know, 30, 40, 50 hofad every single year off the back of your sacrifices. So it's, mm. it's a testament to the work that you guys have done. Mm. It's, it's like amazing. And uh, Allah reward all the rest of the brothers who were with us and went overseas with them, went to Pakistan or any other destination. Obviously, you know, as a, as a Australian Muslim community, which is one of the, we are an old community, but a newly developed community. 
we needed to make some changes. And one of the inspirations that inspired me to go overseas is I saw the need of a homegrown imam. Mm -hmm. And I realized that when I was going to the mosque, you know, I'm older age than you guys. So I still remember those times when I used to go to the mosque. You know, it used to be very challenging. Our parents used to drag us to the mosque and uh, the imams would do their best to make us understand. But it's a reality. There is that disconnect. Mm. So I thought, you know what, someone needs to make a change. Someone needs to take that initiative. And myself and other friends, uh, other brothers and colleagues went overseas. And we did take that initiative to make a change. Go and train, become imams or mashaykh overseas, come back and start educating our brothers, young brothers and sisters and start producing uh, homegrown imams. And uh, that's one of the passions that I've got is to produce homegrown imams because the reality is in the next 10, 15 years, we as a Muslim community, we're going to face serious challenges and crisis. And that is that we have, we're going to have the largest number of Muslims in the country are born or raised in Australia. The largest demographics of the community are born or either raised in Australia but then you've got a small number of imams of catering to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at the 2021 census, I did my own assessment and research on it. Uh, the 2021 census suggests that 40% of the Muslim community are born in Australia, but then 79% of the Muslim community are under the age of 45, 62% wow. under the age of 35, Very and 50% under the age of 25. So if you just take that category, who are 35 and under, which makes 62%, we all know that, that that category of people are either born here or raised here. Mm. And, uh, you know, and the, the community just continues to grow. Like, you know, my parents came here 50 years ago. There's about 22 of us in the family now. Mm. And I'm, I'm sure the same thing with your family or your grandparents and so forth. So we need to start looking into the future. And that's the only way for us to move forward and grow as a community is for us to start training and local imams. Because at this current moment, it's either you bring them from overseas, which has a challenge, or send them overseas. And they mm. come back with a bit of a challenge. I'm not, you know, undermining or belittling anyone. It's just a reality. Mm. Yeah. It's just a reality, you know? What do you um, think the role of traveling is in regards to the spiritual training of a sheikh? Um, because as an example, I, I grew up in, in South Africa, right? Um, and there it's very one-minded. There isn't, like, you don't have an idea that there are other kinds of Muslims, or other cultures and things like that. That's just the culture that mm. I, I experienced there. And then the sheikhs that are grown there can only cater for that sort of a community. And then when there's, a, when there's an influx of another type of Muslim uh, from a different culture or maybe um, a different sort of a tradition, there's a bit of a clash there. Mm. So w w what would you say the role is in regards to the, like maybe the need for travel for a sheikh in that training? No, it's a good question. And that question was raised when we established the Australian National Imams Council. What defines to be an imam? Mm. Okay, because in Arab world, the word Imam doesn't exist, it's a mm. sheikh. Mm. In the uh, Indian subcontinent, Mawlana or Alim, for example. Yeah. So the word Imam is more of a Western word because the word Imam in the uh, Arab world, in the uh, Arab uh, Muslim world, is a huge thing. When you mm. say Imam, you think of Imam Shafi, Imam Malik. Yeah. Mm. Okay, but you know, the, the typical and the t traditional uh, term that they use there is a sheikh. Mm. And even the word Alim, in the Arab world is a bit, a bit of a heavy word. Mm. I remember we had that debate amongst the Mashaykh where we wanted to call the Australian National Imams Council at the very beginning, the Australian Ulama Council. Mm -hmm. And uh, to the Indian subcontinent, Mashaykh Ulama is just a normal word to use. You know, you call any person that graduates from Dar Ulum Ulama. To the Arab Mashaykh, the word Alam is something big, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, uh, just different uh, understanding and uh, definition to the connotation of the wording itself. But Imam is, is becoming more of a common term to use for a Muslim scholar in the Western countries. The other, the other challenge that you have with the word Alim and Sheikh for Aussies, for example, Kha is yeah. a bit of a hard word and Ah is a bit of a hard <laughs> word, you know? So the easiest way is Imam, yeah. you know? And Alhamdulillah, look, there's nothing wrong with it. We call it Imam. Yeah. And then the second uh, contentious point came up amongst the Mashaykh is what defines to be an Alim? Mm. Is it someone that studies at university? Because in the Arab countries, most of them go to universities. Yeah. But That's in the like, India yeah. or Indian subcontinent, they have mm. Dar Ulum. And I studied in Dar Ulum, it's not even recognized by the government, has no accreditation, but he's a full on Alim. He's a full on scholar. So we came with a definition saying anyone that started four years under scholars, whether it's in a college, institution, Dar Ulum, university, or even just a mahad, as long as this person started four years, the classical and traditional understanding and uh, knowledge and sciences of Islam. So that's the definition to us as a alim. That's one or an imam. Secondly, he's got to be recognized as an imam. 
at least you know the community recognizes this person as an imam because you have the other challenge some people did do their graduation did go and study probably bachelor's or even master's in islamic studies but you know the way they behave and conduct themselves they're not really accepted as an imam and then alhamdulillah recently now we had a number of uh, muslim uh, sisters who have qualifications but you can't call him imam because imam mm -hmm. is someone that leads the praise so we gave him full membership in anik and we called him shaykha okay so that's the new involvement in anik and subhanallah because we were closely with other faith communities a lot of them said oh you know did islam uh, evolve we said no islam didn't evolve we've mm. always had muslim female scholars mm. you know it's just we, did, we never had any of them applying to anik yeah. yeah and subhanallah that fascinated me how powerful and flexible the sharia is mm. because you know we're in the 22nd or 21st century and uh, you still have some denominations and faiths are still debating the topic can a female be a religious minister we've had this from the time of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam mm. the wives of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam were great scholars mm. you know we get a lot of our knowledge from aisha and many of the wives of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they're just the challenge with anik is that we've never had anyone apply or meet the criteria so alhamdulillah now we've got the australian national imams council and the membership is imam and shaykhat both of them have equal rights of membership but one we refer to as imam the other one referred to as shaykh mm -hmm. Sheikh, with, when you develop imams you know homegrown imams as you call it or sheikhs are you worried that there will be too many and then people will start coming with their own opinions and then islam just evolving in the country because mm. like we see that a lot you see like these people go to one sheikh or one imam and he'll have a different opinion to someone else and then the, the more you develop this because i feel like when you go overseas it's like a barrier to entry if you start doing these homegrowns and everyone's starting to become sheikhs and imams, are you worried that that will happen where people just, there's, there'll just be too much opinions out there? It's too confusing. Yeah. yeah. It's too, too confusing, confusing for people. Yeah. It is a concern. It is a concern. And it's not about, you know, in the future. It does happen right now. Yeah, 100%. And that's when the challenge emerges when you don't have a head, when you don't have an authority. And the authority can't be done by, done by one individual imam. I can't go as Sheikh Shahid, I'm the authority of Islam in this country. Yeah or this Sheikh Ibrahim or Sheikh Ahmed or Sheikh Mahmoud. But when we come together collectively and we become one team, then we can create an authority. And that's one of the objectives and the visions of ANIC to be that religious Islamic authority for the Muslim community. And Alhamdulillah, we have over 233 Imams from all the different diverse backgrounds from Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So they have to be from Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they have to be mainstream. And it doesn't matter from what group or what school of thought they come from, Alhamdulillah, they've all been embraced. And they've all been welcomed to be part of the Australian National Imams Council. And alhamdulillah, that, that, unique, that unique structure that we've got, it's second to none. Like, you know, you just mentioned South Africa. Mm. But, you know, it's like South Africa at the end of the day is different because you've got one ethnicity or one race mm. or maybe two. Here in Australia, we're very, very mixed. Mm, exactly. You know, we're very diverse. But alhamdulillah, we managed to bring the imams together. And, you know, to the credit of the imams in Australia, they see the bigger picture. It's not about you and it's not about me. It's about us. And in order for us as a Muslim community in Australia, which we are the second largest denomination in the country, which is growing, like you know, going back to the census, we grew 34% in five years from 2016 to 2021. So from 2011 to 2021, we grew about 70, 80%, mm. which means every 15 years, there's a cycle that will double and a bit, you know, and uh, we need to have leadership. Leadership means we all come together. Uh, we'll all share the common goals. And I always remind myself and remind my uh, brothers, and colleagues from the Imams. Unity doesn't mean you have to agree with me 100%, I have to agree with you 100%. Unity means that we have to look at the greater picture. We need to look at the common denominators that we all share, which Alhamdulillah we have 90% in common, and we need to work towards them, mm -hmm. okay? And unity means that if we disagree, it's good, but disputing is bad. Mm -hmm. So this is Alhamdulillah one of the things that we as Imams and as a Muslim community, we had uh, developed over time. So of Alhamdulillah to the credit of the Imams in the last 10 years, I've seen the development with the Imams that we start to learn that, you know what, it's healthy to disagree but not dispute and we need to continue looking at the greater good and the bigger picture and work towards the common interest and benefit of the community. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very good point to bring up and it sort of leads into an area that I've always been interested in. You know, you've got, you're the head of ANIC, so you you obviously the president of that organization, but in that organization you have, you, you mentioned 230 odd Imams. Imams and shiuch are known to be big personalities big ego okay everyone has their own heaps of followers some have hundreds some have thousands how do you go about leading a team like that 
because obviously everyone brings their own unique skill set. But at the end of the day, everyone needs to sort of park their ego at the door and say, look, you know what, when we walk into this meeting room here, we're here to talk about the the greater collective good rather than what's good for my little, you know, subset. So look, I appreciate the question and I resonate with that. <laughs> yeah. It is. It, 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 it's always fascinating that. me. I mean, Even yeah, if you get a few shuruk into a room, yeah. oh, it's uh, your view, my view, yeah. your view, my view. It's, it's egotistical. Yeah, I, t- I totally understand where you're coming from. See, there is some reality to it. I don't want to say full, but there is. Uh, not all of them come in with an ego, but some of them sometimes might yeah. come in with an ego. But this is where we need to start managing egos. Yeah. And uh, this is what leadership is about. Leadership is about managing people, not telling people to do this and not to do that. And, you know, I always remind myself and read about what's the definition of leadership. And there's always, you know, a debate amongst the scholars and uh, the coaches and the instructors on leadership. There's many different definitions when it comes to leadership. But the most definition that resonates with me is that a leader is the one that takes people from A to B. A leader is the one that takes people from a destination to an objective. And, you know, if we want to lead, we need to take people with us. And uh, alhamdulillah, but, you know, I've traveled the world and the imams in Australia, with whatever challenges you might see from them, they are unique. Alhamdulillah, the Australian National Imams Council is known globally as probably the most developed imams council or scholars council or alims council in the Western world. Alhamdulillah, we've always received that feedback. In addition to that, in addition to that, the challenges that the Muslim community went through forced us to work together. Mm-hmm. You know, the reality is no community went through the challenges and the margin, the marginalization as much as the Muslim community. You know, and from post September 11, 20 years, even though the last three, four years, especially after post Christchurch, things had quietened down and calmed down in some aspects. No community faced, no community encountered no community went through what the Muslim community went through. That forced us to start working together. That forced us to start controlling our egos. That forced us to come together around one table. That forced us to start to understand each other and start looking at the bigger picture and, and, and move away from these self-centered thoughts. And I always call it self-centered thoughts. Mm. And that the sa- that's the same uh, you know, mindset that you find within community organizations, masjids and Islamic centers and community leaders where it's just self-centered. It's just about me and what suits me and what suits my organization, which I have no issues with. But we need sometimes to come out of that and look at what suits the Muslim community. Because what suits the Muslim community prevails over what suits me. And that's what the Sharia teaches us. The interest of the community always prevails over the interest of an individual. And that's one of the messages that we constantly remind ourselves and remind the Mashaykh and the community leaders of, that we always need to look at the bigger picture. Because we are t- together, we are strong, divided, we are weak. And at the end of the day, when you go down, I'm going to go down with you. Mm. When I go down, you're going to go down with me. An attack on you is an attack on me. So alhamdulillah, you could see maturity and you could see development and uh, understanding within the imams and uh, within the community leaders. So what really brought us together, besides being sincere and for the sake of Allah and look at the bigger picture, are the challenges that forced us to come together. Mm. On, on that idea of the division, one thing I noticed when I moved here was is that you have like the Pakistani mosque and you have the Turkish mosque and everyone's sort of in their own sort of culture. Um, and in, in South Africa, it's just one type of, you know, thing that's there. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you know that. I've been to South yeah, Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I know so it's it just is. One, one thing, you're Shafi Hanafi yeah. and then you know, that's it. That's you know? it. Um, and the one, one race that's really there and things like that. And then when I moved here, I saw that every, all the cultures were, were, were split. And I didn't really expect that. I didn't expect that all the cultures would be in different areas. I just thought everyone would be together and things like that. And I'm, I'm just wondering, from your point of view, how do we sort of not really st- maybe stop that or get all the cultures to intermix? And, you know, it's fine for me to go to a Turkish mosque and a Pakistani to go to a Turkish mosque and a Turk to go to a Pakistani mosque and everyone can be together. And I, I, I found that really odd when I moved here. So I, I wonder, mm. I'm just wanting to see that your opinion on that. That phenomenon, what you just mentioned right mm. now, it does exist mm. primarily within the migrant older generation. Those who are born and raised here don't really have that mindset. I remember growing up, I remember hearing Arab, non Arab, and then amongst the Arab, Lebanese, non Lebanese, and then amongst the Lebanese, south and north, and amongst the north, <laughs> village and, uh, you know, <laughs> city, and amongst the village, this family and that family, <laughs> which, you know, 
I understand that, mm. but that that doesn't really exist within the next generation. Those are born and raised here, and in our culture, does exist. You know, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was sent to, you know, to a nation that were culture was a religion to him, and, and I always say this in my lectures that tribalism is a religion, literally a religion. The way me and you are willing to die for Allah Azza wa Jalla in Islam, they're willing to die for being an Arab or for this tribe. It was a religion to them. But then Islam came and matured and educated people that you've got something called principles. And you've got something called divine principles. And those divine principles are the Quran and Sunnah that you need to abide and follow by. So people, when they come from a certain culture, especially when they come from overseas, they have that mindset. And I'm not saying it's a wrong mindset. It just exists. We need to overcome that. Okay? And uh, that's why I always say, in order for us to succeed in this country, we need to have one understanding that's called Islam and living in Australia. Sometimes I even might say that and people might even misunderstand me when you say we only have one Islam, which is called Australian Islam in this country. When I say Australian Islam, Islamic understanding according to the Quran and Sunnah, the traditional understanding of Islam with an Australian culture. When I say Australian culture, we live here. Mm. So our understanding, our mindset needs to conform with that culture without compromising our principles and the core principles of the Sharia. Because in reality, as you mentioned, when you go to an Arab mosque, there is that Arab Islam there and there's that Turkish Islam there. And, that. and I'm not saying that there's changes to the principles. I'm just talking about the culture, the way people operate, the way people look at things. So we need to have you know, an understanding that we live in this country and we have the traditional and mainstream understanding of Islam with, a, with an Australian culture to fit in in society. Otherwise, if we really want to grow in this country and prosper in this country, we need to focus on the culture of the country that we live in without compromising the core values of Islam. Sheikh, you've been a big supporter of the Grand Mufti of Australia. You've gone more than once, you stuck out your neck for that position and you've always defended that role. And in for the everyday Australian Muslim, what role does the Grand Mufti of Australia play in ANIC as well as the broader Australian populace? Because you have Dr. Ibrahim Abu Muhammad, who I've had the privilege of meeting many a time, met him today, and we've met obviously through Anik as well. Um, not, very, very nice, very, very a true gentleman. But again, there's a language barrier there. He speaks Arabic, his English does not, he's not fluent in English. And and just keen to understand sort of, you know, where do you see his role or that the role of the Grand Mufti of Australia in the overall Australian Muslim society? So one of the Australian mindsets mm. that we focus on is to move away from individualizing the institutions into institutionalizing the institutions. And that's one of the core objectives of ANIC and that's something that will always remind ourselves and remind the ANIC leadership and the Imams that we're here to institutionalize, not individualize. And when I say institutionalize, we want to create an institution where the institution is strong, supported by the individuals and the institution will continue whether the individuals are there or not. So the Mufti of Australia is part of the institution. And, you, and you've got ANIC, which is the main institution. And ANIC has an executive committee that gets elected from the different states. And then we've got the Fatwa Council. The Fatwa Council is based on the most qualified and the most knowledgeable imams in the country. Where you've got the ANIC executive committee is based on the states. So you get five from uh, New South Wales, four from, or seven from New South Wales, five from Victoria and two from the other states. Uh, the Fatwa Council is chaired by the Mufti of Australia. So the Mufti of Australia, Dr. Ibrahim, who, who I have a lot of respect for, he's a spiritual religious scholar that leads that side of ANIC. Mm -hmm. Because ANIC had gone beyond just uh, you know, the, the religious aspects of things with regards of Fatwa. ANIC is leading a community and Alhamdulillah, that's one of the objectives of ANIC is to lead the community towards the best interests of the community. That doesn't mean everyone agrees with ANIC and that doesn't mean everyone supports ANIC. Even if might even have some imams in ANIC might not support some of the objectives of ANIC. But we need to fill up that void because if ANIC is not going to be there, I'll show you someone else is going to be there. Mm. And that person that's going to be there is not the person that you want him to represent you. And alhamdulillah, ANIC had filled up that void in the best of capability and ability that we can. And part of that is the religious theology and research and fatwa and sharia aspects of things. So we've got a fatwa council that the Mufti of Australia chairs. So he's the chair of the fatwa council. He's the Grand Mufti of Australia. And alhamdulillah, we come together collectively as an institution that we complement each other. Mm -hmm. We complement each other. 
So alhamdulillah, I always look at Dr. Ibrahim as a form of compliment to me as the president. And he does the same thing. And both of us look towards the other mashayikh as a form of compliment. And together we are building this huge fortress, which is called Islam. Yeah, talk, talking about the Grand Mufti of Australia. Now, there was another Grand Mufti of Australia that popped up, right? And I've, I've had friends and, and many other people, especially non-Muslims, non-Muslims, right? And they were, they were saying, look, there's another Grand Mufti of Australia. What's going on? Is Islam a drag? What are you guys doing? And I think he's still around, if I'm not wrong, where there is two Grand Muftis in Australia. Oh, or if I'm wrong, please do correct me. What's going on there? <laughs> How do we stop? I was hoping you're not going like... to ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to. <laughs> Yeah, look, you've got full rights and uh, the community has the rights also to know. So look, it's unfortunate that another Muslim organization did announce uh, a Mufti of Australia and uh, it would have been more helpful for the community, for the community as a whole, regardless of the organizations, to have one Mufti, you know. So it's unfortunate. I, I feel that grief and I was hoping not to see something like this happening because, yes, you're right, it did look, make the Muslim community look like, like a joke, yeah. you know. And, you know, that does make everyone lose their credibility, you know. It's just an unfortunate situation, but uh, hoping and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that things will be resolved in the future. So my next question would be, what do you think the current state is of the Muslim community in Australia or even in, 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 even in the world? Now, where do you think the Muslims are right now? Can we improve? What's, what can we mm. improve on and, and whatnot? No, there's always a room for improvement, you know, and that's something that we learn from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to exert all efforts and put whatever time and effort that's needed. And at the end of the day, he used to seek Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala's forgiveness for his shortcomings. And that's something we learn from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I would say, and start with Australia, I believe that right now, the Muslim community is probably in the best state and best shape they had ever been. From the point of unity, and, you know, that also includes, when I say unity, we're not 100% united, but we're a lot more united than what we used to be in the past. We're a lot more advanced in uh, engagements and uh, building bridges amongst each other. We're a lot more advanced in building bridges with others. And I see that. Yeah. I'm in the forefront of that. So, alhamdulillah, we've managed to build good relationships with like-minded people from other faith communities who share the same objectives and goals. Yes, we, sh you know, we differ in faith and we believe in what we believe in and they believe in what they believe in. But at the end of the day, as faith communities, the attack now these days is on faith. Mm. It's not on Islam or Christianity or any other faith. It's just faith. faith yeah. You know, believing in God these days is like a taboo. Mm -hmm. You know, you believe in God that he's still backwards. Yeah. You know, so Alhamdulillah, we've managed to establish good relationship with other faith communities to work on the common interests that we share amongst each other. Politically, we're a lot more advanced. Politically, we're a lot more engaged and politically, we're a lot more active. And alhamdulillah, that's been resonated by a number of political parties. And we need to be, you know, if you want to be part of the decision making, there's a process in this country. And that process is to politically engage, you know. And that's one of the things I realized that the community also matured in. Ten years ago, like the community didn't even want to have a bar or didn't want to have anything to do with political engagement. But they realized if you want to make a change, this is the avenue. Mm. And that's one of the things that the Australian National Imams Council has been very active in encouraging the Muslim community to be politically active. So as the state that we're in right now, we are by far a lot better than where we used to be in the past in many different ways. At the same time, we have challenges. We are a growing community. And whenever anything grows, challenges grow with them. And, uh, and that's why we need to start thinking about, okay, where do we see ourselves as a Muslim community in the next 10, 15 years? And the number one thing is that we need to start thinking as Australian Muslims before thinking as Arab or Turkish or Lebanese or any other Muslim. Why? Because the Muslim community now is predominantly born and raised in Australia. So I need to start thinking, how does this generation think? How does this generation deal with? And uh, that's why we need to start producing homegrown imams. We need to start catering for that category of people. We need to start you know, cater uh, catering for this group of people and start facilitating programs, education, even the, the narrative, the narrative. And this is one of the things that we've been talking in, in, in Australian National Imams Council. The discourse and the narrative that you educate the new generation is different to the way that my parents used to talk to me. Do you think ever my parents will ever sit me down and say to me, don't you ever <laughs> deny the existence of Allah? Do you think that will ever happen? Never. Mm -hmm. But now you're sitting down with children saying to them, we have to believe in Allah. Do you think my parents will ever say to me, you have to pray? 
that, that was given. They know I have to pray. It's just about, you know, the slap that you have to pray. <laughs> mm. They know. Okay, yeah, but now convince me that I have to pray. I think it's yeah. interesting because <laughs> I've noticed just in my own dealings with other Muslims and the youth and things like that, where Islam has become very r ritualized, where, you know, I pray, but I don't know why I pray. I fast, but what's the meaning of fasting? Mm. Like, why am I doing this? What are the teachings that are behind the rituals and the laws that are within the deen? And that's, I, th I, I from what I've seen, slowly starting to get lost. Um, and I think that is a, is a major issue. And that's what I mean by the discourse, the narrative, the mm. way we teach Islam and the way we preach Islam. And uh, that doesn't mean we change the principles of the Sharia. We will never, ever compromise on the core principles of the Sharia. The traditional understanding, the mainstream understanding of the Quran and Sunnah according to the majority of the, of the scholars. But now the narrative, the way you educate, the way you preach, the way you impart, the way you train, the way you, you know, make people aware, that needs to change. We are talking about, you know, like one of the things that you've touched on, we're talking about a very critical generation that ask mm. why. You know, my generation who are considered to be the children of migrants, we never asked why because that's it. By mm. default, that's how we think. But now you've got a new generation who are highly educated, who are highly spoiled, wealthy generation. The opportunities they've got more exposed to what we're exposed to, more exposed to what we're exposed to. I remember coming back from overseas, I didn't even know how to turn on a computer. Mm. Yeah, but mind you, now I'll teach you everything. About that. <laughs> yeah, so, but you know, you're talking about a generation from two years old, they're already on their laptop, yeah. laptops, on their iPads, very, you know, like highly educated, highly, you know, spoiled. Uh, the challenges are less with regards of the convenience of life, which puts people in a more spoiled, convenient position. So th th that's why I always say the narrative, mm. the narrative needs to change. I'll give you an example. The other day, about a month ago, we had a meeting with a group of imams and scholars and we had guests from overseas. And that guest was talking about the Bilad al-Mahjar. Bilad al-Mahjar is a very common term that's been used by the scholars, which is the land of migration, the land of migration. And some of the mashaykh were repeating the same word. Oh, okay, the land of migration. So I turned around and said, brother, please, you insult me when you talk about the land of migration. The land of migration to you, but not to me, not to my kids, and not to the 80% of the community. Mm. So now that, okay, you know what, you've got a point. See the narrative? I can't call Australia. The, to me, it's not my land of migration. To you, it's not the land of migration. My kids are second or third generation that are born from parents are born here. What, when you say to them, the land of migration, they're going to turn around and say, what do you mean? Mm. So the narrative is wrong here. Okay, land of migration for someone who migrated to Australia. You can't talk to the one who's born and raised in Australia and tell them, Allah, Bilad al-Mahjar. That's not Bilad al-Mahjar to you. So when I say the narrative or the discourse needs to change, that doesn't mean you change in of the principles of the Sharia or you change in of the teachings of Sharia. It's the approach. The approach needs to change. And subhanAllah, we've learned that from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu His approach in Mecca and his approach in Medina. Even the Quran, we have the Mecca verse and the Madani verse. And what, what d distinguishes the Madani verse from the Mecca verse is the approach. You see that in the Quran. Karim. So the approach towards teaching Islam, promoting Islam, propagating Islam needs to change. We can't continue to be the way we are 20, 30 years ago. And we see that in the second and third, and now we've got fourth generation that's born and raised in Australia. So we need to just, you know, move towards that. And that's something they'll always say to the Masha, going back to the point that I mentioned before, that this is something I can't do on my own. You can't do it. This is where we all need to come together collectively and do it together. Mm. Mm. So that's what I'm You mentioned about the next generation kids and whatnot, and, you know, you go through all the various programs at Annie Quran. One of those programs is uh, the liaising with educational organizations and establishments and whatnot where, you know, you run programs in public schools and to, to educate about Islam and religious studies and whatnot. Um, we're starting to see this shift now, for example, through curriculum and whatnot at the, at the highest level, this trickling down through organizations where, you know, there are certain, um, there's certain uh, narrative, messaging, teachings, whatever it is that are being imparted on innocent children that, you know, as Muslim parents, we're concerned about, I've got two little girls going to school and I'm like, well, what are they learning? I can have, I can fortify my home environment as best as I can, but what they learn out there is what they learn out there. And I also need to prepare them for life outside the home as well. I can't create this false bubble and say forever you're going to be preserved and protected. You won't be, realistically, you won't be. So 
what, could, you, could you share with us a bit more about the, the efforts of ANIC in that regard as well and what's going on in that space? Because that's mm-hmm. clearly concerning to everybody. So this is where ANIC comes in when it comes to the collective good. Because you've got over 300 Muslim organizations that run their own organizations, that operate their own centers, and they do an excellent job. But then you have the collective good that we all need to come together. All of us need to come together. It's like, you know, I always give an example. It's like, I care about my kids and the education of my kids, but I can't go and establish a school on my own. Mm. I need to have other parents and other children in that school to make that school. Otherwise, I could go and open a school and put my kids in there. What, they're just going to be two kids or three kids just in a classroom? So we all need to come together. And uh, one of the initiatives of ANIC is the scripture program, which is known in New South Wales as the SRE, which is the Special Religious Education. You come from Victoria, you don't have it because... You know, I'm not sure if it's the current government or the previous government. It used to exist, but then they abolished it, hoping the shadow could come back. So according to the New South Wales legislation, every child has the rights of one hour education a week of religious education. So alhamdulillah, we're an approved provider by the New South Wales Education Department. And in New South Wales alone, New South Wales alone, we have 50,000 Muslim students in the public system, not in the private system. There's an equal number to that or just less than that in the private system. So there's about 50,000 Muslim students in the public system, whether in the primary or high school. So they're all entitled to that one hour. Unfortunately, and I say this with full grief, we can't cater for them mm. because most of our programs are volunt- uh, voluntary programs. So, yeah, so this is one of the things that we do is that we try and educate those youngsters. But then that's one avenue that you need to tap into. Then you've got the Islamic schools. Alhamdulillah, most of the Islamic schools are doing well, but they're struggling themselves. They are struggling themselves. And then you've got after school hours, you know, and a lot of Muslims are disconnected from the masajid. So this is the perception that a lot of people think in our assessment, we, th- we, we believe this 80% of the Muslim community are not connected to a mosque. 80% of the Muslim community. And, you know, going back to the point that this is one of the things I always mention to the mashayikh, the 20, 30 people that come to you are not the community. Mm. The 20, 30 people that come to my masjid are not the community. That's a very small portion of the community. 80% of the community are not connected to Masajid, are not connected to a Sheikh, are not connected to a mosque. And we need to cater for them and Anik, Anik caters for them. You know, Anik, you know, tries and, you know, make announcements that connects to them. Like, for example, the the Ramadan announcement. You know, yes, at the end of that, a lot of people go back to their Masajid and go back to their local mosque. They don't really care about what Anik says. Mm. But what about the 80% of the Muslim community who are not connected to a Sheikh or an Imam or mosque? They need an announcement. They need to follow something. So, yeah, this is where we try and cater for that area. But uh, on this topic in particular, it needs to be a collective approach. And this is what we aspire to establish and initiate as ANIC is to have a collective approach when it comes to educating Muslims. And when we talk about education here, we're not talking about, well, do we teach them wudu and salah according to the Hanafi and Shafi? No, no, no. I'm not going to go near this area. We are starting from scratch, the foundation, the foundation where you're a Muslim and you believe in Allah and Muhammad and you need to take pride in that. And that's one of the areas that we focus on is the preservation of Islamic identity. And what's the preservation of Islamic identity? That you're a Muslim, but not only Muslim, you must be a proud Muslim. I want my kids to grow up proud Muslims, not just a Muslim, mm. proud. That I say it with pride, I'm a Muslim. And I, I, I take pride in my faith in my rituals, in my salah, in my siyam, in my hijab, in my bid, whatever it is. That's a very important point. The integrity of the Muslim community because unfortunately, because of the ongoing challenges that the Muslim community had gone through and the Muslim community being marginalized for a very long time, even though alhamdulillah we are coming out of that and that's due to the great work of all the imams and Muslim organizations in particular, ANIC and the Alliance of Australian Muslims that we managed to bring 200 Muslim organizations together. We need to embed that sense of pride in our children that not only they are Muslims, but they are proud Muslims. Okay, And part of that pride, they are also Australians. I want my kids to contribute to the country that they live in. I want them to have that sense of belonging living in this country. Otherwise, you know, if they're not going to have that sense of belonging, they're not going to contribute. They're not going to excel. Everything to them, what's the point? No, no, there's many points. And we want to embed that in the minds of our children and that's what we're planning to do inshallah as a community as a collective and a whole community yeah so i have a question and 
honestly, I don't even know how to ask this without getting cancelled. Mm. I'm becoming a bit concerned with, with your questions. <laughs> you know? yeah. I, have, I have an interesting question. I'm going to try to say it in the most politically correct way. And if I do get out of line, mother just hit me. Um, the Western culture, the Western world, is is completely against Islamic values, right? And what we see now, what's being taught to children, babies, I'm sure mothers, ex- mothers experience it with these children, what they see in cartoons, it's, there's interesting sexualities, there's very interesting genders, and all this is being fed to children, right? At schools as well, you know, people are becoming inclusive, and these things are becoming very, very, very normal. And without getting into the specific, I'm sure you're understanding what I'm saying. My question is, is there a future for Islam in the Western world? Because they are completely against what we believe in. And every time you speak up, it's almost like you get cancelled, right? And people shut you up. It, Muslims, happen, that's happening to Muslims as well now. Like, when you talk about how a female should dress, how a male should dress, um, when you talk about, you know, you shouldn't, you know, these sexualities or these genders, you know, it's not part of Islam. And people protect those. Even Muslims are starting to protect those as well, just to fit into the Muslim world. Um, so my question, coming back to what I said, is there, is, is there Islam in the, in, the, in, the, in the Western world? Is there a future for Islam in the Western world? Because sometimes I think about, because I have a 10-month-old daughter, and I think about, I'm like, okay, in a few years' time, it's 100% going to get worse, what they teach the kids. Do I just fly to a Muslim world, to a Muslim country? Like, what do I do? I get wider. And as a parent, you think, if I teach her what you learn at school or what you've seen on the internet is wrong, and she t- says that to her teacher or something, I'm going to look like a horrible parent. They're going to take it to festival and foster care or something, and, I'm, and I lost my child because I'm an abusive Muslim parent, right? So come back to the question. Does Islam have a future in the in the Western world? A man came to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and asked him a very interesting question. And he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, if I'm living amongst my people, if I'm living in a community where there is a lot of corruption, should I leave them and live in uh, jungles or live in a cave on my own and worship Allah? Or should I stay amongst them and try and, my, and, try and make a change? So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, replied back to him and said, for you to stay amongst your own people, make a change is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than you secluding yourself. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had already given us the pathway. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now you mentioned a few things and you said that the Western world is totally against Islamic values. I, I wouldn't agree to that 100% because we share a lot of agreed values yeah. with the Western world and the Eastern world and the Middle Eastern world. And we disagree in some values. Yeah. But the opportunities that you have in the Western world the opportunities they have in the Western world, you don't even have in your own Muslim country. Which I'll come back to the next question. And many Muslims think of that. Okay, I can't live in Australia no more. I want to go overseas to a Muslim country. Please tell me with that Muslim country because I want to go with you. I would love to follow you. Like Dubai maybe? Okay. <laughs> because I guarantee you right now, the opportunities that you have in a country like Australia as a Muslim is by far a lot greater than the opportunities that you're going to get in those, what you call as Muslim countries. It's a reality. But you know, Alhamdulillah, it's not like we are oppressed here. Yes, sometimes we are marginalized, sometimes we are targeted. Things are changing, Alhamdulillah. Things are changing. And it's like, you know, it's a tangible change that everyone can see. But unfortunately, those Muslim countries that you refer to, you might have restrictions in different areas. Yeah. You know, like for example, this podcast right now, you didn't need to get in authority for you to hold this podcast. But I'll tell you, in those Muslim countries that you just mentioned, some of their names or overseas, mm. you probably need to get you know <laughs> through different layers of authorities mm. for you to get that so you know unfortunately there's no ideal time there's no ideal world there's no ideal place we need to deal with it and that's where alhamdulillah islam comes in strongly and aggressively islam gives you that resilience mm-hmm. islam gives you that flexibility to conform i have not seen and you know, not just because i'm a muslim but I've looked into other faiths and communities and denominations. I have not seen a religion that's so resilient, mm. so flexible, so concrete and solid as much as Islam. So Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa we have that flexibility, we have that resilience that we could fit in any time, in any day, in any place, in any era. And that's why Alhamdulillah, you find Muslims up until now, Islam is still the most solid religion out of all religions. That's because of the re- resilience of Islam. And you could be a strong Muslim wherever you are. So, you know, 
we live in a Western society. Yes, the Western society does not conform with all the Islamic values, but there's no other place around the world that also conforms 100% with the Islamic values. Mm. Mm. This is the situation that you are in. In this country that we are living in right now, yes, you've got your freedom for you to practice your religion. Yes, there's a wave. But right now, the wave is not just against Islam. The wave is against faith in general. Mm. You know, 10, 15 years ago, it used to be, okay, look what Islam says, look what Christianity says, look what Judaism says. Now look what, you know, look what religion says, or look what faith says. And that's why we're, we've never been closer to faith communities as much as we are right now because we share that common interest. We see that our interests now are connected to each other because there is an attack, there is a wave against faith. You know, like, you know, believing in God is becoming like a joke. Mm. The end of times, Sheikh. End of times. Yeah. But yeah. the end of times, like, you know, a hundred years or a thousand years, Allah yeah, Alam. Uh, and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu gave us an answer. He said, if someone's planting a tree or someone's planting a plant and the day of judgment has been called, what do you do? Continue with it. Mm. SubhanAllah, look how amazing Islam is. The teachings of Islam, as I mentioned. You know, the teachings of Islam are more powerful than what you and I can even think of. That's why we are strong. And that's why we are in the 21st century, 2022, on the other side of the world, coming together here in Sydney. And alhamdulillah, we're still practicing Islam. We're still holding fast onto the deen. Why? Because of the teachings of Islam. On, on that idea of resilience that you mentioned, I think that there's a major issue when it comes to, to cancel culture. Because I think, I think what, what I find is that, that there's a lot of people, even in the Western world or Western ideologies, who actually agree with some of the teachings that we have but they're actually afraid to speak out against what is, you could say, the liberal left is, is one of the ideologies. Um, they, they're afraid to, to speak out on that in, due to the cancel culture. If I say anything about it, I might not even be a Muslim or anything, I just have a different idea on it. Even having the debate or a conversation, you could cancel and you lose your job because you're not leaning towards what say, the government wants or, or that ideology ones how can we be resilient and and trusting in a time when cancel culture is so rife so this is where i go back to the point that i mentioned we need to start identifying allies from outside the muslim circle and bring them together and work together on those common values that we all agree and we need to start pushing back and we live in a society that there are avenues for you to push back and the way you push back is for you to lobby for you to engage for you to make submissions for you to go and speak, for you to you know advocate, for you to protest. There are avenues that you can undertake for you to raise your concerns. As you know, you're talking about those leftists, for example, they didn't have a voice 10, 20, 30 years ago. They became very active and now they've got a very loud voice. Be active like them and have a loud voice too. You know, we can't continue to be complacent while people are putting time and effort. And this is something generally as a Muslim. We we'll always talk about, oh, look at this community, look at that community. Oh, look what's happening to us. But brother, the difference is that community puts thousands of hours while you're sitting at home doing nothing. And, you know, and I've always mentioned that we need to be part of the solution, not just always identifying the problems. Because alhamdulillah, as a community, as a Muslim community, when it comes to identifying the problems, we are second to none. No one can, no one can surpass us. We will make a problem and we could identify 10 problems out of one problem. When it comes to the solution, that's when everyone stops. Yeah. And when we do come up with a solution, we don't want to ex execute it or you know, put it into practice. But subhanAllah, when we look into the rhythm and the pattern of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu there's a problem, what's the solution? Let's act upon it. And that's something that you see within the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. And one of the inspirational stories is the member of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi When the congregation of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi expanded and grew, women were pushed back further away from the congregation. So they couldn't hear the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So one old woman came to the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam and complained to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She identified the problem. Oh, Messenger of Allah, we no longer hear you. After more people start to attend your gatherings, we start to get pushed back and we're not along, we're not, we can't, we can't hear you anymore. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam understood the problem. But she said, oh, Messenger of Allah, that's the problem. But I have a solution. My solution is for me or the solution is for us to get a member, get you to be higher, and this way your voice and the waves of your voice will reach us all the way to the back. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam liked the idea. Then she said, oh, Messenger of Allah, I want us to take a step further. Can I get a carpenter and get him to build a member for you? So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes, go ahead. 
So now this member is the member that you find in millions of mosques around the world. That's a problem that was identified. There was a solution that was given and there was an execution that was done by an, an, an old woman. Subhanallah. So there are problems, yes, but we need to look into the solutions. We need to look, and then after we look into the solutions, we need to look into reasonable practical solutions too. After we look into that, we need to execute them. And alhamdulillah, as I mentioned, we as a Muslim community, we are getting better. You know, we are evolving, we are advancing, we are maturing, we are becoming more educated, more understanding, and more engaging. Sheikh, we, we speak about unification and whatnot and the importance of it, and I think that's, that's quite clear. One area that I think we're struggling a little bit with is around halal food certification. There are so many different organizations, some products that have certification, some that don't. Um, these days you have, you know, lot, you walk into lots of restaurants and everyone says, oh, this is halal, or this is halal, or whatever the case may be. I, I think Anik also do some work in that area as well. How are we going to come to a point where, like for example, in South, in South Africa, right? You've mm. got Sanha over there. Sanha yeah. is, is, you know, all encompassing organization. There is no one challenging what they're mm. doing. It, almost every product is certified. You got, you have that, and you can consume whatever you like with a lot of confidence. That it's, it's going to be okay. How are we tracking mm. towards that in Australia? Because obviously it seems the, very disjointed. Yeah, obviously the halal certification and consumption in Australia is another challenge that we face. And one of the reasons that we face that from a positive side is that the community is growing. And uh, Alhamdulillah, the community eats a lot too. Yes. So that's a good thing <laughs> because that's our halal entertainment, as we always say. <laughs> exactly. And Alhamdulillah, as they say in Arabic, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know enjoy. Um, and we are conservative. So as a community, we, are, we continue to be conservative. So we are very observant of our religion. Uh, the challenge that we have is that because it's not st standardized and regulated, so obviously people like to get into the market. Some people go in with a good intention. Other people go in with good intention, but sell vested intentions. Other people want to commercialize it. And because there's no regulation, there's no standards, there is a mess. And we are involved in the halal certification and we aspire that we can standardize it. Yes, people turn around and say, okay, but you have no authority. Well, at the end of the day, we'll put the standards up to people if they want to follow on that. Right now, I have no authority to force anyone to pray. Mm. We just tell them to pray and you have to pray. Whether they pray or not, that's between them and Allah Azza wa And likewise, we'll tell them this is halal and this is uh, haram. This is halal for consumption. This is haram for, con uh, haram for consumption. It's up to people if they want to follow it or not. So, yes, that's one of the challenges that we have here in Australia is the mess around the halal certification and there's no local and domestic standards and uh, because it's uh, highly commercialized so people are willing to put the commercial interest over the islamic and, the, and what's right you know uh, the islamic interest uh, and inshallah that's one of the things that we aspire to do and inshallah hoping that we can achieve now obviously to get authority you need to get regulations from the government or you need to get support from the government the Australian government is a secular government. They will never put their hands into something like this because they will just say, this is a Muslim community issue, let the community deal with that. And uh, if we're not going to be united on it, which I find that's going to be more challenging than anything else because for people to let go of self-vested, commercialized interest and say, you know what, I'm, you know, I'm making $2 million a year from the halal certification and now if I'm going to follow this standard, it's going to go down to a million dollars. Some people, are not all, but some people won't make that sacrifice. Yeah. But it is, it is commercially very, very attractive, particularly with exports, right? So we export a lot of beef and whatnot into the Middle East, across, you know, the Asian mm. uh, con countries as well. So it is very, very lucrative. Very commercialized, right? but the, the, the overseas market is regulated by the overseas countries. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you want to export to Indonesia, they have their standard and they won't let, their, they won't let your products, they won't let Australian products get into Indonesia unless you follow their standard. That's why the overseas market, the more safe, I wouldn't say the 100% safe, but the more safe than the local market. The local market, you could put a halal certificate and no one's going to stop them. Mm -hmm. You know, but, you know, I've seen halal pork. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I've seen halal fish, you know, and they'll put it there. You could make the community aware, but there's nothing, there's no standard, there's no regulation, there's no authority that would say that this is right or wrong, beside the religious authority that we have. And that's one of the things that we mention 
like people tell me in general, what authority does any have, for example? And it doesn't have any legal authority, but we have cultural authority. Mm -hmm. We created a culture called 230 Imams under ANIC, and that's a cultural authority. That's why people would like to listen to ANIC. But do I have an authority where I could send you a fine or I could send you a penalty for not following? No, I don't have the authority. You could go and start your own Imams Council tomorrow, no one's going to stop you. You live in a free society. So that's why we need to create a cultural authority. A cultural authority within the Muslim community. We create this culture where we say, okay, if this is not approved from this body, we're not going to take it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you're going to get everyone 100% on board. But Alhamdulillah, at least safeguards those who have an interest in it. Mm. Yeah, you are right. Like, you know, when people go to a restaurant, I'm, I'm guilty of this as well. Like, you, you'd see a restaurant, right? And the, they won't be the 100% most shady compliant, right? They'll have, they'll sell pork, they'll have, have alcohol. But under the table, they'll bring out a certificate and say, we're halal, and the Muslims will go there, mm. right? I guess what I'm starting, what I'm starting to understand is there's there's a lot of fronts that Muslims are not united in, right? Be it halal certification, be it even s something so simple as when is Eid, right? Mm. When does Ramadan start? When does Eid start? There's multiple organizations that say okay, it starts today, and then and then one pops up and says it starts tomorrow, and the day it gets it becomes a mess, right? It's to me it seems like we are still very far away from having one authority. Because there are so many people, so many rebels who just keep popping up. Do you ever see in the near future ever becoming one authority that takes charge? Because it is becoming, there's so many out there right now. And it's starting to become, like, well, like what, what, I, what I said before, it's starting to become like a joke, almost. Okay. Look, the reality is, and to be frank, we will never ever be 100% united. I will never ever have 100% authority that everyone will follow. Mm. Because if that's what you and I would love to have, the Nabi didn't even have it. Yeah. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi he didn't have it. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi in the same gathering, he had Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and he had a group of Munafiqeen who were fighting against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi in the very same gathering. So that was a challenge that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi faced. Yes, he had the authority from Allah and the Sahaba followed him. But he also had those people on the side who are always causing problems and also causing division and so forth. So this is a reality. It's a reality that we have to deal with that we will never be 100% together. But what we need to do is aspire to be 100% together, work towards it and get those people on board and continue moving with them. Otherwise, if I'm always going to think about, okay, out of the 100, I only have 50 people with me. And, I'm, and then this is going to be an obstacle for me to move forward. We're never going to move forward. So we just need to put our heads down, focus, and alhamdulillah, continue moving forward. Something better than nothing. And uh, alhamdulillah, we've progressed. You know, that's why the Muslim community right now is, is in a lot better shape than what it used to be in the past. Because alhamdulillah, we put our head down, we focused, we're trying to achieve what we can achieve, and continue moving forward. Those pockets of people on the side that will always cause some hindrance or they will cause some obstacles or they will be loud here and there they will always exist they existed during the time of the prophet and they'll exist in our times now this is the challenge that we need just to keep our heads down and continue moving forward but you know, the thing is like with the internet right now it becomes more amplified this problem yes and that is why you know back then there was no internet and it's everything's like tight knit right now like people could do massive damages with the internet and that, that's a massive, massive problem. Absolutely, yes. And uh, we've seen that where unfortunately people pay attention to unverified yeah. mm -hmm. information, misinformation, whether in the deen or outside the deen, you know. And uh, it does cause damage. And we just have to deal with it and mitigate it as much as we can and continue moving forward. It's a reality that we can't escape, unfortunately. And uh, it's, it's there. We just have to deal with it. Yeah. Before we wrap up, either of you have any big question to ask him? I've always wondered, Sheikh, well, there's, there's two things. One is a bit of a, a plug for your own, something that you're very proud of, UMA, right? So you're the founder of UMA, United Muslims of Australia. Um, and uh, the UMA, it, it's a center that does so much good. Could you share with us and our, our, our listeners and viewers as to, you know, what, what, what was the, I guess, the primary motivation behind UMA? What got you into it? And what purpose, do you, what, what, what purpose does it serve? Mm. So the concept of the UMA is the Australian Muslim concept that I spoke about before. Mm -hmm. In the past, an Islamic center used to be a masjid, maybe a few classrooms, and that's it. But I've realized this new generation, a masjid is not 
enough for them. They need more than that. So we came out of the concept of having a center, just a mosque, into a one-stop Islamic center where you pray, you play, you hang out, you eat, you train, you learn, you come with the family, the husband and wife, the children all come together. So alhamdulillah, this is what we managed to establish at the UMA Center. So currently, alhamdulillah, we get over a thousand people every single day. And alhamdulillah, we've got a gym, state-of-the-art gym. We've got a full basketball court. We've got a masjid. We've got education facilities. We have two cafes. And the cafes just give typical Aussie food. Okay, so it's not like they're going to go there and get some rice or some curry or some kebab. Mm. Okay, they get the typical Aussie chicken pie, pie, chicken and all that. Yeah. You know, the pies and sausages, the, you know, the pizzas that those youngsters you know, connect to. And uh, alhamdulillah, it's open. The UMA literally closes two hours a day. So it's open for 22 hours. Wow. It happens from 4 a.m. Although it's one or two o'clock at night. And alhamdulillah, we've got people are coming in and out. Those people are going to the gym. Those people are going to the basketball hall. Those are people are going to the boxing gym, youth area, into the masjid, into the cafe, into upstairs. And alhamdulillah, this is only the first phase. The second phase is going to be 10 times bigger than this phase. Even the first phase is one of the largest Islamic centers in the country. We're occupying about 3,000 square meters of floor space. So the vision of the UMA is to be a one-stop Islamic center where people gather, they pray, play, hang out, eat, train, educate themselves, do everything in one place. And alhamdulillah, it's a place that people connect to. When I was young, if my father wanted to punish me, he would take me to the mosque. <laughs> yeah, I'm dragging you to the mosque. You go there and you sit, you sit on the ground and you just like this. <laughs> You don't understand what the sheikh is saying. And during my time, there was no phones for you to play with. You know, you just sit like this. That was a bit a bit of a torture, you know, yeah. for me. And my brother and I, we used to go, they just sit like this. Now, alhamdulillah, I know that families, if they want to punish their kids, you're not going to the UMA. Yeah. They connect. Alhamdulillah, it's there. But also, we've created the culture in there. We've created the culture. The number one culture is, you are welcome no matter, no matter who you are. It's not like, wallahi, if you are non-Arab people are going to look at you and say, what are you doing here? Or if you are non-Indian people are going to look at you and say, what are you doing here? Because some people feel that. Yeah. Okay. The other culture that we created is that we are non-judgmental. You could be whoever you are. You could be whoever you are. You could be a brother that prays and mashallah you've got a beard and you could be a brother who's full of tats and coming into the center. You are welcome because you know we want to bring these people in there. You could be a sister that's, uh, a sister that's wearing the hijab and niqab you could be a sister that's not wearing the hijab. You'll walk into the UMA center and you'll receive the exact same reception as everyone else. That's why people love to come there. We have non-Muslims who come to the UMA, who come to the kifai, who go to the gym and train there, who go to the normal. Alhamdulillah, they just, we are non-judgmental people. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we want to be an example. And Alhamdulillah, we average about three, four people embracing Islam every single week because of this, Alhamdulillah. So Alhamdulillah, the UMA is one of the busiest Islamic centers in the country. And Alhamdulillah, it's a typical Australian Muslim center, Islamic center that, that uh, resonates and connects to the mindset of Australian Muslims. And inshallah, we hope that we want to expand and not only expand, but also expand different states and cities because we've seen that model to be a very successful model for those who are born and raised in Australia. And Alhamdulillah, just, you know, it continues to grow. And we're trying, you know, to always look and explore different avenues for us to continue to be connected to the youth. So, for example, we have the youth program, then we have the youth development program where we select a group of young, selective uh, Muslim brothers and sisters and empower them to become leaders in the future. So we have a full program for them. And uh, alhamdulillah, we have the Sharia courses and alhamdulillah, we have the first accredited, approved Diploma of Islamic uh, Studies in the country. And uh, inshallah, we aspire to establish the first Islamic higher education provider to start producing homegrown imams. And uh, alhamdulillah, we have our own studio. Obviously, you're talking about a generation that they spend more time on their iPads and phones than coming to the mosque. So you need to engage with them. And it's a void. If you're not going to be there, mm. someone else is going to be there. You know, like, you know, I always get this complaint from parents and imams saying, oh, look, a lot of our kids are on social media. Yes, they are. What did you do about it? Mm. You haven't given them an alternative. That's why they're on it. And the UMA, the primary concept of the UMA is always to give an alternative. I can't tell people stop doing something if I don't give them an alternative. You want them to stop the haram, give them halal. Mm. You want to stop them to be in bad environments or being on the street, bring them to the mosque. But you can't tell, you can't take some, something from someone and not give them. And subhanAllah, you see that in the style and the, uh, the approach of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Yuma is that one-stop Islamic center that uh, Alhamdulillah has been 
an inspirational center for many people and uh, it changed the lives of many people and it's not just about the structure it's the structure and the mindset the culture that we've created mm. in there that attracts a lot of people alhamdulillah mm. okay chef before we wrap up i do like to ask our out of out of interest questions now these are just 10 rapid fire questions um you could answer as fast as you want or as slow as you want it's totally up to you depends on how quick you want to go home okay um 10 questions first question for you is your favorite muslim scholar of today my <laughs> you can't say yourself <laughs> uh, alhamdulillah interesting you know i would say two people one local one overseas right. uh i'm inspired by dr yusuf qaradawi i find him to be right. a great scholar okay. Uh, that doesn't mean I agree with him on everything, yeah. but I, I I am inspired by him uh, by his uh, knowledge, rahmatullah alayh, and Dr. Ibrahim. Dr. Ibrahim is a very inspirational yeah. uh, scholar, and uh, mashallah, his mindset and the way he uh, looks at things is an inspiration. Yeah. Beautiful. Favorite Sahaba and why? Favorite Sahaba and why? Okay. <laughs> I know always when you ask people, Umar Khattab is the first one that comes <laughs> up here. Yeah? I just, you know, I love Abu Bakr and Umar Khattab and I love them all, of course. But Umar Khattab, you know, the leadership of Umar Khattab mm -hmm. and the day and age that he was in, it does resonate a lot with us. Do you yeah. have a favorite hadith? Do I have a favorite hadith? Okay, interesting. All of them are favorite. Is that a good answer? That's, you could say that. <laughs> That's the easy way out. Uh, uh, do you have a favorite mosque in the world? A favorite mosque in the world, the UMA, yeah. after Mecca and Medina. <laughs> <laughs> um, wife's cooking or mom's? Okay, both are good. Uh, one is a typical Palestinian, the, uh, the other one is mixed between Lebanese and Aussie. So both good, yeah. Both good. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Okay, you don't want to sleep and eating, today. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, right. and eating out is good too. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favorite food? Okay, favorite food. Well, you've hit me up with things which are a bit confusing, you know. <laughs> You know, I'm known that I eat anything. So, Alhamdulillah. Sure, there's a preference. Sure, there's a favorite. I'm a very easy going person. <laughs> uh, whatever's on the table, I, I eat. After, after you survived Pakistan, everything I, I was going to say, to you in Pakistan, <laughs> made me eat anything. Uh, what motivates you most? My deen. Your deen. Oh, Beautiful. my deen motivates me a lot. Do you have a deepest fear? Deepest fear, yeah. the next generation. I'm very concerned about 100%. the next generation. That's 100%. the biggest concern that's in my life right now. I'm not worried about the safety, the security, the well-being, uh, the wealth, the comfort, the health of this next generation. But I'm very concerned about their aqeed and their belief, yes. Okay. Um, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? 18-year-old myself? Yeah. Uh, when I was 18 yes. years old? Well, okay, because my son now is 18 years old. What so. advice would you give him? Okay, he's in he's in Qatar now. He's watching the FIFA. Oh, What's the Aussie game today? <laughs> <laughs> he sent me some photos. He's a very good boy, alhamdulillah. Very proud of him and his brother. Uh, if there's an advice that I give myself when I was 18 years old, be more wise, patient and forbearing, and then jump into conclusions. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm good at that. Yeah. That means he was very hot-headed at 18. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the last question, um, I'm hoping you give a good answer with this one. If you could ask the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, any question, what would it be? Well, you've asked me tough ones, you know. I've never been asked those questions before. There you go, we're unique. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've always thought about it. If he's around, I'll always ask him had the, the Muslim lifestyle in this day and age in this country. Okay. It's unique. And, you know... There's a lot of developments, a lot of evolvements, uh, a lot of changes. I would love to hear his perception. Even though, alhamdulillah, the Prophet ﷺ passed away and left us a lot of guidelines. Mm. Yeah. But you would like to hear it direct sometimes. Yeah. You would like to hear it, you know, concrete. So, alhamdulillah, the Prophet ﷺ passed away and left us guidelines beyond what your average person can think of, you know, and beyond any other faith and religion. But, you know, sometimes you would like to get his take on it, you know. Especially in the modern world. Yeah. Mm. It's crazy. Especially in this world. day and age. Yeah. But um, that concludes the questions, Chef. I Thank you do very really much. I really appreciate it. I've got a sense of relief. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if I asked any questions you didn't like. Um, I do. I did think about the tough ones. Um, but I appreciate it. I do thank you ever so much for coming here. And I personally have learned a lot from what you've, how you answered my questions particularly. And because those questions are very self, 
serving for me because it's I've, I've wanted the answers for those ones for mm. myself and I do appreciate it. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, Chef. And, Zaka um, Lafayer. Hopefully we'll see you around. Hopefully at the UMA. Hopefully at the UMA. Looking forward to it. Are you there it. all the time? Or? Always. Always. Yeah. Ahlan wa sahlan. You're all welcome there anytime. What's your favorite thing from the cafe? Yeah. Well, the, you know what? The UMA cafe is not a bad cafe. You should come down. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm pr- no, there's a conflict yeah, of interest exactly. of me promoting my own cafe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Zaka